May the Lord be with you. Good morning and Happy New Year on this first Sunday of Advent, the first day of the Christian calendar. I'm glad that you're watching this as we prepare our season and prepare our hearts for the coming of Emmanuel, God with us. Let us begin this service by having a word of prayer. Let us pray. Great Lord, we ask for you to prepare the way. Prepare the way of our hearts, prepare the way of our minds, prepare the way of our world for the light coming towards us. We ask that our preparations may bear fruit, that our preparations may make not just us, but those around us ready for your word and your will. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the first Sunday in Advent. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. O Lord, our God, you call us to work for a world where all will be fed and have dignity but we find ourselves distracted by our own desires. You call us to seek justice and peace, but we are satisfied with injustice and discord. You call us to bring liberty to the oppressed, but we do not insist on freedom for all. Forgive us, O Lord. Turn us to your will by the power of your spirit, so that all may know your justice and peace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Hear the good news. As people born of water and the spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism and be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. 
Amen and amen. May the peace of Christ be with you, each and every one of you. And now together we are invited to pass the peace of Christ to those we are with, both in body and in spirit. Peace be with you. first reading this morning is from the Old Testament, book of Genesis, chapter 3, a familiar story, beginning in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God turned to the serpent and said, Because you have done this, Cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And God turned to the man and said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not, you shall not eat of it, I said. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall spring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you returned, return to the dust. For out of you, you were taken, and you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Our second reading for today also comes from the book of Genesis. This time we fast forward to the 22nd chapter, however, verses 15 through 18. Listen for God's word. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your own son, your only son, I indeed bless you. And I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today begins the, the beginning of the liturgical year, the liturgical season of Advent, but also the, the whole year in the church, because the liturgical year follows the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so it makes sense at the beginning of the year is the run-up to the birth of Jesus. 
to the Word made flesh, to the incarnation of God in this world, to Emmanuel, God with us. And so we often start with scriptures that, that foretell the coming of the Messiah out of the Old Testament, especially the prophet Isaiah, right? The, the famous ones that you, you all have heard before. The voice of one in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. The prophesying about the lion laying down with the lamb, all of these come from Isaiah. But today we've backed up even further to the very beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, specifically the the stories of them being uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden and of Abraham. The, the, The weird thing about the story of Abraham here is you don't see the rest of it. This is actually during the sacrifice of his son Isaac. And when he's about to sacrifice his son, God says, great, you obeyed me. You don't need to do it. But here we are in the story of Genesis. So what gives? Why are we beginning Advent here? Well, this year for Advent, we're doing things a little different. Yes, we're still having families light the Advent wreath, and we're still having uh, families do the traditional readings. But the rest of our service is going to be inspired by a different source. Have you ever heard the term lessons and carols? It's celebrating the story of the birth of Jesus by alternating readings from scripture and Christmas carols. And the original form of lessons and carols dates back to over 100 years ago, actually 102 years ago, to Christmas Eve 1918. And it was developed by the the choir master and the choir at King's College in Cambridge, England. And their version of Lessons and Carols, which originally was nine readings and nine songs, it was so successful that for decades it was broadcast across England on Christmas Eve. And and even today you can get the King's College Lessons and Carols probably on television on Christmas Eve. Various people carry it across the world. When I was in the choir at Princeton Seminary, we did a version of Lessons and Carols. And our JPC Christmas Eve service is based kind of on Lessons and Carols. But we've trimmed it down to being five lessons and more carols. So we have one lesson for each of the Advent candles. But the original had nine lessons and nine carols, which, yes, is a lot of scripture, and a lot of singing. And so this Advent at JPC, we're going to be focusing on two lessons and two carols each of the four Sundays of Advent. And the ninth and final lesson and carol will be used on Christmas Eve. Spoiler alert, the ninth carol is Silent Night. So that's why we started here. Our first two lessons from Lessons and Carols are in Genesis. Because the original service of King's College recognizes that the story of Jesus doesn't begin in Bethlehem at the manger. And it didn't even start at the prophecies of Isaiah. The story of Jesus goes back to the beginning, back to Genesis, back to the story of God and creation. The story of Jesus is part of the relationship of God and creation. So what do the stories of the fall of humanity from the Garden of Eden and the promise of the covenant to Abraham, what do they have to say about the the story of the birth of Jesus? Well, it reminds me of an interaction I had in seminary. I, I was very young when I went to seminary. Not a lot of people go straight from college into seminary. Most people take a year or two or more off. And I had come out of of the large university setting, right? I was a history major at Michigan, and I was used to being in lecture halls of 100, 200, 500. Questions were for the graduate student instructors during our discussion sections. They weren't for the professor in front of all these other students. But other seminarians, however, didn't feel that way. 
And they had no problem throwing up their hand in the middle of a lecture and asking the professor a question. And, and some even forcefully challenged what the professor was saying. That was not me. I was there to absorb all I could from the lecture, not to, own, not to offer my own theories or theologies. And the only time I can remember going up after lecture to, to ask a professor a specific question was after class one day in my first year during New Testament 101, and the professor was Clifton Black. And the lecture had been on the formation of the canon of scripture during the early Christian councils. That is why we have the books of the Bible that we have that make up the New Testament. This was during the time when people had been publishing books like the Gospel of Thomas, right? There was a craze back in, in the 90s and early 2000s. And I found it interesting that there are about 60 versions of Gospels, 60 versions of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus put down on paper. And yet in the early church canon, in the early church meetings, in the early church councils, they picked just four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And some people had offered up the idea that it was because those who were making the selections picked the ones only that favored them. And so after class that day, I walked up to Dr. Black and I said, Dr. Black, how do we know that they got it right? How do we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are divinely inspired by God? and the others aren't. Dr. Black began his answer to me by asking a question. He said, do you believe that those people making those decisions, do you believe that they were people of faith? Well, yes. Do you believe that God had called people into the life of faith to be on those councils, that people were led there by the Holy Spirit? He continued, we trust their judgment as, as much as we hope Christians in the future trust our judgment when making decisions that affect them. Do you see, he said, if we believe in the providence of God, that God has a hand in our world and in our faith, then aren't we to afford not just ourselves but others that God is working through them and God worked through them he said the body of Christ, though, though it's been going for millennia, it's connected together that we're all called by God, that we're all moved by the Spirit in some ways or another. It's not that we don't make mistakes, but that we're all called together. Why do we see these lessons and carols at the beginning of Scripture? Because that's where the story of God and God's people start. And look, the relationship gets off to a really rocky start, right? Adam and Eve fall short of what God is expecting of them, and they're forced to live a much different life outside of the Garden of Eden. And just a handful of generations later, we, we have this really crazy story in the midst of Abraham's life. Now, God's already made the promise to Abraham numerous times, Genesis 12, Genesis 15. And yet in Genesis 22, we have one of the hardest scriptures in all of the Bible, where God says, take that son, the son that you've hoped for, the son that you've dreamed of, and sacrifice him to me. And whether we think Abraham's good or not in this moment, he does it to the point of raising the knife over his son's body. And God says, don't do it. But I see your obedience to me. The promise is secure. And so these stories tell us that God walks with us from the beginning through to now. God makes his promise, his covenant to Abraham and all that come after Abraham, that God will be with them and God will be with us. 
That's the first thing we're to remember this Advent during this strange, weird, unsettling season. That God walks with us. God always had, God, is, God always will. As we prepare for the coming of Emmanuel, for God with us once again, we are reminded, though, that God has never left us. As we prepare for the light to enter our hearts, to enter our world, we are reminded that God is already walking with us and walking with those who've come before us and those who come after us. And so what's the second thing to learn? As we look at the stories of Abraham and others in these lessons and carols, it's that we can look to learn from those who have come before and those who originally began this tradition 102 years ago. The Christmas that Lessons and Carols was birthed into was really challenging. Christmas Eve 1918 is just about six weeks after Armistice Day, after the end of World War I. England was both grateful that the war was over, but they were also reeling from this notion that that the destruction and the death all around them, Europe lost a generation of men fighting in the trenches of World War I. And add on to it this fact, December 1918 was the height of the Spanish flu pandemic. And so this thing of beauty, of song and reading that has inspired generations it was forged at a time not so different than our own. So what lessons can we learn from those who developed lessons and carols? This Advent, as we tell the stories, as we sing the songs, what joy and peace can we experience in our lives? That's going to be our theme flowing through Advent. What beauty can we find in such a challenging and tough world? as we prepare for this world to come. Maybe we can find some solace and comfort in music. And maybe we can find hope even in these challenging times. For listen to the first verse of one of the carols for this week. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel, and God will come to us and take us out of our lonely captivity. To God be the glory. Amen. We come to our time of sharing our joys and our concerns. A few things to be aware of. Uh, Lynn Mule is still down in Texas receiving cancer treatments, uh, radiation. And we lift up uh, Bree as well in our prayers. Let us offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. Wonderful and merciful God, this first Sunday of Advent, we ask for you to prepare our hearts. To prepare our hearts for your spirit, for your love, for your grace. We lift up Lynn, we lift up Bree, we lift up all of Maryland's list, all those who are battling cancer. We lift up also those who are uh, battling COVID. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are watching over those who are sick. We pray for all nurses and doctors, all healthcare professionals. We ask for you to be present with all of us during this time of Advent as we celebrate, but as we are also apart. We ask for you to be present with us. We pray for your church. We pray for all churches around us, for all who carry your name, who all who carry you in their hearts. We pray for your whole world. We pray for the creation that you have bestowed upon us. We pray for those in war-torn lands that they may find peace, and those in oppressive lands that they may find freedom. We pray all of this, not just what I've spoken out loud, but the prayers that are deepest within our hearts. We pray all of it in your name. 
Amen. And now we say the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we sing our closing hymn. A couple announcements as we finish this service. Uh, I hope everyone has received their Advent wreaths at home. Thank you to all who delivered them. Thank you especially to Steve Chandler and Cindy Barter for their efforts in getting all of this up and going. Uh, I'm grateful for their work. Uh, a couple other things to mention. We're looking for another round of peace photos, so especially Christmas themed or Advent themed. Uh, so feel free to take a festive photo and, and text it or email it over to me. I ask also that people send pictures of their Advent wreaths put together. I received the first one from Don Badgley, so gold star to Don for being the first one in. Um, other announcements, thank you to all who helped with the Ernie Glenn Christmas uh, toy drive. Uh, we, this year's haul was amazing. We're grateful for that, and the, the people in the city of Milwaukee are grateful for that as well. With all that said, receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom God calls you to love. From now until our Lord comes again in glory. Amen. This is the sanctuary of my home church. As you can see, they're busy setting up the Christmas tree as well. This is where I was confirmed and ordained, where my sister was married, uh, and where my father's memorial service was. My favorite feature of it actually is the pink brick, the entire floor is this beautiful brick, though it makes a huge noise when you drop something heavy on it. This is my home church, Grosseal Presbyterian Church, here in Grosseal, Michigan. It's where I grew up, and I would tell you my dad always said that God must be a Packers fan because they paint the sign green and gold.